And now uh, Professor Amber Clark is going to give you an introduction to our federal Indian law course, which will be taught in the spring. Okay. Um, well, I, I didn't think I'm, I'm not going to necessarily do uh, in, in introduction to the course. Um, I, th I think what would be more helpful um, is a quick explanation um, for for why one might be interested in thinking about why it might be important to actually have an Indian law class um, in a in a university in a, in a law in a law school because some do, some don't. Uh, and I think there's an idea that the places that should or do are places where there's a whole, everybody knows there are a whole lot of Indians around, places like Arizona State. Um, and, I, and I think that's not that's really not necessarily the, the best way of thinking about it. Um, and I and I have about 15 minutes, which is uh, really just about enough time to mess up a job interview or a first date. Um, uh, and I, I, I really would fail miserably trying to sum up the whole body of law that has to do with the relationship between 567 nations within this nation um, that really wouldn't work. So I'm going to try to make um, th three, three points. Um, the first, I think, is uh, something that has come clearly through uh, Travis's talk and through the, the, the talks that came before that, and that's you know this stuff matters, right? Uh, uh, and, and and what Marcus said at the beginning too. You know, this matters because even there are still people who have a responsibility to all of the land here, and there. This is, we're not talking about um, a body of law that is about the past. Indian people. And Indian tribes and Alaska Natives, indigenous folks are still here and we are integral parts of the day-to-day -day cultural, legal, economic, governmental um, fabric of this country, right? Even in places and in times and in contexts where that's not entirely obvious. And I think there is, and I guess the second point is that there is this kind of um, background thought that Indian law is old law, right? That it's about history, right? Um, and that's a misconception, right? Indian law has changed, is changing. In fact, it changes a lot faster than a lot of other bodies of law. Um, because Indian law is based on the reaction of all three branches of the federal government to tribes exercising the inherent authorities that they have pre-existing the founding of the United States itself. Right? As tribes and as native people change in some ways and stay the same in some other ways, which is the same as it's always been and always will be, right? change in some ways, stay the same in some ways. The law governing how the federal government interacts with us also changes. Um, sometimes the wider society, in, and when I say the wider society, what I, what I really mean is the, um, the way that the wider society projects authority through statutes and regulations and executive orders and judge-made law, all, all of the trappings of, of law. Right. Sometimes a wider society is uncomfortable with tribes exercising their authorities, right? And says, my uncomfortableness with you exercising your authority is more important than your authority to do so. Right? So there's lots of laws that are that that way. So for example, are the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. That's a great example of right. People think that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act gave tribes authority to do Indian gaming. No, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act reduces the authority of tribes to do gaming, which is simply the, well, the, the, um, the reason they wouldn't be able to do gaming would have been state law. Right? And we're talking about tribes, not states. 
Another example for that would be uh, the Indian Civil Rights Act, which restricts the authority of um, tribes to act in certain ways or to make certain kinds of laws. And another example of that would be the whole line of cases going starting with the uh, Oliphant versus Suquamish Indian tribe, which is the line of cases that um, restricts or in some cases completely strips away the um, criminal jurisdiction of uh, tribes over non-members or non non-member Indians. Um, but importantly, the opposite is also true. Sometimes the wider society, again, reflected in laws and statutes and regulations and, um, and judge-made law and all sorts of other trappings of traditional law, says, look, there has been a, an, an injustice or some bad thing has happened right, or is continuing to happen. And we actually think it's important right, to do something about that. Right? Invariably, that comes after the tribes themselves have reacted to the injustice uh, through, you know, through activists and through their lawyers and through their lobbyists um, and a couple occasions through their members of Congress. Um, so they decide that the wrong has been committed and they actually want to try to support tribes in their efforts to make things better. Some good examples of this are the rise of robust tribal consultation. Um, the, there was uh, some talk earlier of the Indian Self-Determination Act. Right? That's another good example. Um, and another good example of that would be the Indian Child Welfare Act. These are federal law, federal Indian law gets created because tribes react in a certain way and then the feds react back in some other way, good or bad, right? Or restricting or, or expanding, all based with a, an existing base of, of inherent authority that has absolutely nothing to do with what the feds decide they want to do or do not want to do in the first place. Right? And that's not something that gets talked about. Right? The, this is not something that you hear on the news. It's not something that you hear in the rest of your law school classes, but it's something that's actually really important. And so this is my final, I guess my final point on why is this stuff important is this is a spiel that some of you may have heard before, but Indian law is actually a pretty critical uh, course, I think, that for law, law students to take. And, and I mean that is even for those who are not planning to go and work in Indian country, right? There's some folks who are planning to go be advocates for tribes, right? And then it's pretty obvious why they might want to take a tribe, take an Indian law class. Um, and it also might be slightly less obvious, but still pretty obvious that if you want to go be a business attorney or do real estate or do something like that in South Florida, well, you better know something about uh, the folks who are the economic drivers of the area around you, right? Um, but there are also some pretty important, not quite as obvious, kind of business relationship things. And one is that um, you, you very might likely be in practice and run up against the opposition of a tribe. Right? And when you run up against the opposition of a tribe in practice, and this happens a lot, sometimes you might win. And if you win, we want to win in a way that is not doing actual harm to people. And I think a lot of the actual harm that's been done to Native folks has been done with people who are just trying to do their job, right? Or they're just, or they are not understanding the values of this person who may be opposing them, right? I think there are a lot of situations where people are trying to do development, for example. And they run up against an opposition to a tribe, and now they the opposition from a tribe, and now that tribe is the enemy, right? And we're going to beat them, right? And then when we beat them, we do actual harm, right? So I think what's important for folks who are just in practice regular, you know, regular attorneys, right? Or this is actually even it might even happen um, maybe in a more kind of visceral sense in dealing with the Indian Child Welfare Act, where you are trying to do something that you see as good that might cause actual harm to somebody else. Right? We try to figure out how to understand both sides or all sides of the situation, right? And 
do law, do practice, you might be a judge, write a decision, right? In a way that's going to come to an answer that is consistent with the law and consistent with good for all the stakeholders, right? That's not always possible, but you're not going to be able to do that unless you understand the history, the thought process, and the legal regime surrounding one of those big, big stakeholders. And it's also really important because it's a basic matter of understanding how the American federalist system works. You know, you always, you go through constitutional law as a, as a one hour, you hear about federalism a lot, right? <laughs> federalism often is um, justified, right? You know, the, one of the great arguments for federalism is that states, states are the experimental foundation of democracy, right? Adam is smirking over there because he knows exactly what I'm going to say next, which is that's not true. You want to, do you want to see where places where people where people are actually experimenting with governmental forms, trying to figure out what works best for communities, sometimes failing miserably and sometimes doing a great job? Well, you look at the 567 federally recognized tribes, which have a huge variation. That's where the ex feder federalist experimentation is happening. It's not in the states. And also, just for a basic understanding of the American system, right? it doesn't make sense to go through law school only having spent any time studying two of the three sovereigns that we have in this country, right? or three, two of the three types of sovereigns we have in this country. And this is, uh, this is going to sound a little crass or crude uh, as an illustration, but, but I'm going to use it anyway. Don't punch a cop in Indian country. Don't punch a cop in Indian country. Travis, uh, Travis made a, like a reference to this before, but due to uh, the quirks of cross deputization, the craziness of um, civil jurisdiction in, in Indian country and in uh, native lands, um, and the fact that you're dealing with a sovereign nation, right? You just punched three, you very likely just punched three sovereigns and could, could get hit with, prosecuted three times in a row without have running into double jeopardy issues to do the separate sovereign doctor, right? People are laughing a little bit because you're like, wait, that can't, that's, that sounds weird, right? It is weird, right? It is weird, but why do, we, why do we go to law school? We don't go to law school to figure out the obvious stuff. We go out to law school to figure out why the weird stuff is weird, right? And whether that's a good thing and if we should do something about it, right? You might think that that sounds like a giant miscarriage of justice. Or you might think that that situation sounds perfectly right. If you punch a cop, you should get hit, get hit with three separate prosecutions, right? We can have an argument about that. But if you don't take, the, if you don't have any ex ex exposure to that, well, then you wouldn't know to have that argument in the first place, right? And I think that's actually something that's important. Because I think it makes you a better law student and a better lawyer. Um, Indian law is often about how the basic black letter law that students learn in their low, you know, first and second year of classes, right? Or you know, even in some of the more complicated advanced classes, how those areas of law are twisted and changed, and I don't mean twisted necessarily as a derogatory term, how they are applied differently in this separate context. Right? And um, like, like you, as you'll find out like when you're studying, often the best way to figure out whether you know something really well is to try to teach somebody else it, or to put it in another context and see how it applies, right? This is, you, you wanna know how contract works, right? Try to figure out why contracts are different when you're dealing with a truck, right? Yeah, uh, you want to know civil procedure, right? Figure out how Rule 19 applies um, uh, in with, with a tribe because it becomes complicated, but in a fascinating way, right? And being able to work through those problems is going to be helpful to law students in the future, whether they have any interaction with tribes or not. Um, and as I said earlier, there are some places where even if you don't think you're going to be working directly for or against tribal interests, where well, you're very likely to run into this. Right? Um, you're going to understand employment law better if you if you figure out how employment law changes 
in the Indian context? Because it does. Sovereign immunity matters a lot when you're doing with employment. You know what? You know where else sovereign immunity matters a lot? If you're working for a, federal, a state university, right? Um, for employment law. Um, another th place is, but if you're doing, if you want to work in family law anywhere in this country and you don't know how the Indian Child Welfare Act works, you're doing a disservice to your practice and your, and your clients, right? And you very likely um, can do actual harm to a family. Right, even when you're trying to be helpful. Right? That has happened over and over again in Indian country, and it's heartbreaking for everyone involved. So do us all a favor, learn about ICWA. Um, and finally, having an understanding of Indian law helps in understanding the events happening across the country. It's really hard to understand what's happening right now in Lakota and Dakota lands up in North Dakota, right? or in other places where there are ener major energy development um, projects going on without understanding the context of why certain certain places certain people are standing up so so strongly and why other people across the country are standing up to support them or oppose them right right it's really important to understand the history that goes into them and the current not only just the history but the current statutory and regulatory and permitting and tribal governmental in all of those contexts, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and we just are dealing with emotions. Same thing with the Gold King mine, the EPA disaster, right? Why, it's hard to understand why that matters besides the just obvious intrinsic, oh, a bunch of pollution came out, that's a bad thing. Right? Understanding why, that, why that's more important than just another spill or just another bad thing. We have to understand those contexts. And importantly, understanding those contexts and how they work in Indian country allows us to better find solutions for processes, for problems and issues that affect all of us. So um, as I'm sure everyone in the room knows, there has been an absolute epidemic of sexual assault and domestic violence happening in this country, right? Some of it's, we have some better awareness, but also, you know, it's it's bad. This is serious, serious problems happening in this country. But you know who has gotten hit the worst? Unfortunately, I mean, it, it just, either it's incontrovertible that the community that has hit, been hit the worst is a native community, right? The statistics for domestic violence and sexual assault for native women and for native children are... Um, if, if, if they don't just viscerally hurt when you read them, right, there's a, there's a serious problem going on. A lot of, not all of it, right, but a significant chunk of the reason for why that is happening and it has been happening is a body of law, some statutory, a lot of a judge made, that has created generations of jurisdictional loopholes in areas of non-enforcement that have allowed folks to be predators without, with complete impunity for generations. Um, and finding the solutions for si fixing those problems, right? Figuring out how to make things better in these com in the communities that have been hit, and hit the worst with this problem will probably, or should, I should hope, have some bearing on how we can fix or improve or make progress in affecting that problem for the rest of the country too, right? Even if you don't have a connection to those particular communities, figuring out how to make things better there and listening to the people there and seeing how they've tried to um, improve on in their communities teaches us lessons that we can apply elsewhere. And I'll finish with the last, the last thing I want to say on, on, on that is that that doesn't just mean in places that are heartbreaking, things that are heartbreaking. That is things like infrastructure development too. And, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I say infrastructure development, um, mostly I'm talking about transportation and information infrastructure because that's what I worked on. I wrote contracts for tribes to 
build roads and bridges and hospitals and things like that. If we want to know how to get safe and efficient roads, transportation infrastructure across this country, which is we are lagging behind so badly it's not even funny, right? We need to look to the people who are doing the most with the least. We need to look at the people who are taking tiny, meager amounts of tribal and federal and in some cases a little smidgen of state funds, right? In stretching it to do massive, massive things for their communities. And we need to take those lessons and apply them outside. And even if we don't get to the specifics in that class, you're not going to be able to then go out into practice and say, you know, when you're working for a municipal government and you need to be able to put in a culvert and you want to be able to do it in a way that is not environmentally destructive and doesn't cost you so much money that you have to lay off four teachers, right, which is, happens all the time in Indian country, right, you need to be able to know to look. And I think most attorneys out there and certainly most folks who are graduating from law school right now don't even know to look. So I guess that's my little bit of explanation on why I think it's important uh, and why I'm, I'm incredibly thankful to be able to be here, to be able to start, kickstart the process of that being a, an important part of the curriculum here. Right? And, I, and I hope that it spreads even more into places where people are not necessarily going to be going to a place for the specific purpose. Some students certainly are, right? But for the specific purpose of being an advocate for tribes. But lawyering is going to be better as a career and lawyers will be better as a community if we know to look outside of what has kind of been the traditional areas of law. So, thank you.